terms like actually even before we get to there, I'd, I'd be interested in you know um, cultural Marxism. You know what what does that actually mean? And you know do they get because yeah. I think p- people seem to use critical theory and, and cultural Marxism sometimes as kind of synonyms. Um, and I, I'd be interested in kind of your, your thoughts on that. Can we, yeah, just define those two terms, critical theory and may- maybe even just a very quick touch on, on Marxism just to, to <laughs> cover our bases, if that's all okay. right. Oh, man. All right. So, okay. Th- and this gets very complicated very quickly. So, mm-hmm. you know, Marxism was the philosophy or the ideology promoted by Karl Marx. He obviously was sort of the, he produced communism and um, the idea was largely, stri- well, it's, it's very complicated. But- it, it, it is. Yeah. I, I realize that's a tough question, but it, it, as, as summary as you can, we've got a couple hours. <laughs> okay. All right. So, okay. Br- very briefly. Okay. He had this idea that, um, the, the the society all of society's ideas everything in the superstructure of society ideas religion everything else on the, the society superstructure was a function of was determined solely by the society's base that means its economic base how uh, the the means of production were controlled and so uh, I'm not going to get I'm not an expert in Marx by any means at all uh, but he wanted to and and he saw that the existing society in his day uh or or capitalist societies had really produced uh you had you had the the owners on the one hand who own who control the means of production the capitalists and you had the proletariat the oppressed workers who were then you know essentially uh, enslaved they were but they were oppressed by the system and all of their the value of their labor was stolen by the the owners the capitalists so, but but those idea, that idea, the economic idea, was not what was mainly uh, taken over by critical theories. So that was Marx in the uh, 1800s. But then in the 1930s, uh, a bunch of Marxists, known as the in the Frankfurt School in Germany, they wanted to apply Marx's analysis more broadly, not just to economics, but to other features of culture like uh, mass media. And so the Frankfurt School is a group of sociologists, and they, again, they applied that critique to more than just cla- class structure. It was mainly class, but it was mainly it was also about how uh, ideas can uh, produce domination, and they wanted to emancipate people from various forms of domination. And, and that, but that, and then another major thinker who was, in a very convoluted ways, connected to them. He was not part of the Frankfurt School, but Antonio Gramsci was an Italian neo-Marxist. And his big contribution to this discussion was the idea of hegemony. Hegemony means the control of society's ideas. That becomes very important. So for Gramsci, uh, the ideas of society help to reinforce the oppression of the workers. So how does, so his question was this, he was looking back on the history of, you know, of class oppression. And he said, how come the workers don't revolt? Right? Why are they? Why are they participating? Why are they? They're, they're supporting capitalism when they're being oppressed by it. He couldn't figure out why. So his idea was, well, the workers have absorbed certain ideas that make them complicit in their own oppression. So you ask an average worker, why don't you? Why don't you revolt? They'll say to you, because I, you know, it's a good system. It's a, you know, if I work hard enough, I can make it. I can survive. Mm. So those ideas were actually um, producing or actually keeping them complicit in their own oppression. Okay, so take the Frankfurt School and Gramsci. That was 80 years ago. So critic, uh, the Frankfurt School developed the term critical theory in the 1937 essay. But that field of critical theory uh, has expanded tremendously in the last 80 years. And it has created entire fields like queer theory, uh, black feminism, um, critical pedagogy, critical race theory. These would all be under the heading broadly of critical theory, or they're sometimes called critical social theories. They're all different sub-disciplines within this very broad umbrella category of critical theory. And today, they all, and they're, what's what's the commonality of these different critical social theories? What they all have in common is they're all trying to understand how power circulates to reproduce social inequality and injustice. Hmm. And they, so they, and then, and then, and this is again. This is where it gets, the terminology is complicated. So some people call this 
ideology, cultural Marxism. And it makes you understand why they're doing it, because number one, that term uh, was used by critical social theorists themselves in like the 60s and 70s. They called their ideas cultural Marxism. Their books are entitled things like cultural Marxism. And they were people that were writing in the tradition of the Frankfurt School. So it's not a conspiracy theory. It really is an, a, a term that they developed themselves. However, that same phrase has been co-opted by very anti-Semitic neo-Nazis to describe this crazy conspiracy theory. So the term has two different meanings. And today, most people who use the term pejoratively are associated with this crazy anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, so w- which I want obviously to avoid. Mm-hmm. So the pr- and if you talk to scholars today, they will almost uniformly refer to critical theory. So it's a better term because you're like, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about what they themselves say are the foundation of the ideas. Um, and I, but it, it's a, you have to understand it's a hugely broad area of knowledge. And so mm-hmm. people will say, well, that's not critical theory. This is critical theory. No, that's not critical theory. This is critical theory. So you, ha- it's, it's really, the terminology is very confusing. Okay. That's so, a- oh, go on, do you have a question, Phil? It was just, just the, because one of the questions that we got from, from before was how we end up sort of re- reaching the topic of critical theory in church youth groups. So that's in the back of my mind. Mm. If you're to, to kind of summarize a little bit what it, it looks like and maybe that'll come out of the wider conversation and maybe that's a question we can have later on i'm, I'm happy for you to <laughs> control the flow if, the, if it's too too soon for the summary but are there like a few a couple of things that we you go that's that's critical theory like there's things that are common um throughout these wide range of definitions that people people throw out uh, yeah. and Sorry, Neil, just to, just to correct, I think my question adds on to what Phil's saying um, to sort of build on that is is why why should we be concerned about critical theory within the church and culture as well? Maybe that might sort of... So I think one way to sort of organize what critical theory is and how to think about it, the place to start maybe, and even with youth group, would be what is oppression? So we're going to find that a lot of terms that we think we recognize, terms like racism, white supremacy, oppression, justice, equity, equality, terms like that. We hear those terms, we think, oh, I know what those mean. I'd say, no, you don't. These are terms that have been redefined within the context of critical social theory or critical theory today, whatever you want to call it. And so you always have to ask people to define their terms. And if I had to pick one term that's been redefined in a very significant way, that really in all of critical theory today flows out of that redefinition, it would be oppression. So let me just read you a quote from, uh, let's see, I think this is Mary, no, it's Iris Young. I'm gonna pull it up here. Um, so if you look at the, the I mean, oppression is a biblical word. The oppression is used in the Bible all the time. And in Isaiah 53, Jesus himself is called oppressed and afflicted. So we can't get rid of the word oppression. It's it's Mm -hmm. a biblical word. But traditionally and biblically and in the dictionary, oppression refers to things like tyranny, coercion, violence, and cruelty. So when people are oppressed in the Bible, it refers to their being treated unjustly, unfairly, cruelly. Uh, Someone's imposing their you know power over them taking away their rights robbing them murdering them that's oppression and he's like, that's, yeah, that's what oppression is okay critical theory has redefined that term so let me read a quote to you from iris young's s very very famous essay five faces of oppression she says this in its new usage so she's contrasting the old usage cruelty uh coercion violence in its new usage Oppression designates the disadvantage and injustice some people suffer not because a tyrannical power coerces them, not because of that, but instead because of the everyday practices of a well-intentioned liberal society. Oppression is embedded in unquestioned norms, habits, and symbols. This is huge. And once you shift your definition from the traditional one 
to this new definition, pretty much everything else that we're seeing today within a contemporary critical theory follows. So she's saying oppression refers to not just cruelty, control, and tyranny. It also refers to when uh, ideas create sort of norms and values that are taken as common sense, but which serve to marginalize certain groups, to make them seem less valuable, less normal in any way. Okay, so you're, if, if, you're, if society has embraced some standard that, that devalues or marginalizes certain groups, makes them seem not normal, abnormal, that is oppression. Now, we don't often, because we don't ask, we don't ask people, well, what, define your term. What do you mean by oppression? But that definition is really everywhere today. And people and Christians, they hear oppression, they think, oh, biblical word. Are you for or against oppression? They say, well, I'm against oppression. I'm a Christian. It's, it, the Bible talks about how we should be against oppression and for justice. So they assume that we're talking about the same meaning. But in reality, that definition is going to have severe cascading implications. So here's just one. Based on that redefinition of oppression, how do we understand how society is structured? Well, if oppression is encoded in norms and values that seem you know, common sense and objective and universal, well, who's, whose norms are those? Where are those standards coming from? The answer is, the critical theory gives, is those standards are not actually universal and objective. They are being imposed by some oppressor group. There is some group that is imposing their norms and their values on the wider culture. And those supposedly objective standards are really serving to justify their social dominance. So for example, whites impose their white values and white standards on culture and those standards are used to justify why white people have you know this dominance in culture and why people of color are subordinate oh it's uh, why 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 are people of color subordinate oh it's it's easy you see because white people are they're more hard working they're they're more they're smarter they're blah blah, blah. they they it's, it's all meritocracy it's all fair so those very ideas that are appealed to are real, they really serve to justify the power of the ruling class. Same thing with men. You know, why is it that men are most, most CEOs are men? Uh, most, uh, take your, take your, most scientists are men. Most engineers are men. People will tell you, oh, it's totally fair. You know, because men are just, men are smarter. Men are stronger. Men are courageous. Men are supposed to be the protectors and providers. So that I mean, it's totally fair that men have all of the power. See, that's the lie, the norm, the arbitrary power that's being exercised over our culture's ideas by the patriarchy. And you can, but there, and so once you accept that idea of oppression, you end up with these groups. You have oppressor groups and oppressed groups. Oppressor groups are the ones imposing their norms and culture. That's called hegemonic power. They have cultural hegemony. And the oppressed groups are those who are subordinated or marginalized by these standards that are taken for granted as fair, objective, empirical, universal, whatever. Um, so that we can go and there, that's just the, the, the implication just keep, it's like dominoes falling, they keep going. And so what critical theorists do is they try to interrogate and dismantle these so-called objective norms and, and expose them as it really bids for power. It's very much a, a notion borrowed from Foucault, the postmodernist. Um, I can, so I can stop there and sort of answer questions. So if, um, okay, so if, you know, for, for me, um, on the face of it, I could see how that could be, um, you know, what you described or how they've redefined it could be understood as a kind of oppression. But not, yeah, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm not advocating that as a, a definition of, of oppression, but I can understand how that could be, those things you described could be understood as a kind uh, of, of oppression but if if we take that definition of oppression seriously i was thinking it kind of seemed to me that, that kind of makes the term meaningless in a sense because if we if we for instance a sort of thought experiment if we swapped around now the groups that they class the oppressors and the glass the, the group that we call the, oppre uh, the oppressed 
if we swap them round so that now the people, the group who are oppressed and now the oppressors, well, then all we've done is swap different values and norms mm -hmm. for existing ones. And so we would then have recreate the cycle again, where the, 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 the people who are oppressed then have to try and swap, you know, almost swap around again, try and change those norms and values. So it's, it, it just seemed kind of meaningless as you were talking about it, if that's how you define it, if it's this constant struggle for, um, I don't know, does that make sense? I'm not... Yeah, well, so, so they, they would define, so this is another implication, critical theorists define social justice as the elimination of all forms of social oppression, where, again, oppression is understood by the definition. So they would say, they don't want, yeah, you're right. They, they say they would agree that, yeah, you don't want to just reverse the roles and have a new set of hegemonic norms that oppress some other group. They don't, they would say, we don't want that. They would say they want a society in which power is shared. There is no hegemonic norm that excludes anyone. Uh, now, now it's a little bit complicated because you, they would, they would fully admit we've never known such society. Like we, it's completely utopian. We, we don't know of any culture in history that somehow has no norms or no hegemonic norms at all. But that doesn't stop them. They would say, we just need to interrogate and dismantle the oppressive norms that currently do exist. And and again, their their idea is that once we get, uh, we want a society in which hegemonic, nor there's no there's no one hegemonic discourse that is accepted by everybody that excludes anyone. We wanna have diversity, right? That's one of the big buzzwords. We want to bring in different groups and have them all share power so that no one group's norms are dominant and oppressive and excluding other people, right? So that, that's their idea. You know, whether it's practical is, is another question. But here's a, a more important point. You said, well, what you described is a kind of oppression, but not the definition of oppression. I would say actually no, because, and this is, this is the key, by that definition, that whenever you have a hegemonic norm, it is by definition oppressive. That's false. Why? Well, here's a hegemonic norm. Murder is evil. Murder, that's a, that's a norm. We, you know, we, you, thou shalt not murder is a norm. And oh, of course, if you ask Jews and Christians, they'll appeal to it. Oh, it's not a, it's not an oppression. It's actually God's command. Ah, uh, yeah, right. You know, all you're doing is you're claiming it's God's case, it's universal, it's a universal moral norm, but really it's a way for your group, your religion to maintain its dominance over other groups. Now, in this case, you'd say, well, that's ridiculous because every group says mur murder is, is immoral. Ah, but what about sexual norms, right? So, so it, yeah, so what we realize is that we're, again, we're going to we say, well, God created human beings with certain values with certain uh what's normal for human beings the way he designed us that's the way we ought to live and that includes sexual ethics but they would say you're doing the same thing you're still claiming that your arbitrary uh, imposed values are universal and it's a way to marginalize lgbtq people so we see through that we are going to subvert your norms we're going to dismantle this this claimed universal value which really is just your own group's value which makes you feel superior what you begin to see is the problem is not in the definition the problem is that norms are not oppressive not all man-made false norms are so i totally agree if i you know if if one of the norms we've had in our country in the u.s in the past is absolutely white people were considered to be better than people of color that was, you know, it's in, it was in our laws for a long time. It was in a, you know, so we had a, a truly oppressive norm where we all were taught or in our, our laws taught whites really are better. They deserve to be on top. They deserve to have power. That was an oppressive norm, but not because it was a norm. It's because it was a man-made norm. It was not truly a true value. It was one that we created for our own benefit or, yeah.